And now, from God's Unchanging Word Studios in New Orleans, we are pleased to bring you news, nuggets, and insights with today's host, Tom Carey. Well, greetings, everyone, and welcome to God's Unchanging Word and another edition for our news, nuggets, and insights. Today is Friday, March 19th, 2021. We are just a week away from Passover. Actually, next Friday is the first time since we've been doing our program that our nuggets will fall on Passover night when you begin to watch it. And as we say, we get a twofer this coming week. Busy weekend. We'll talk about that toward the end of our program. All right, let's get into it. I got a lot to talk about today. Cancel culture. Actually, this is kind of interesting. It's a little video by uh, Governor Huckabee. I just came across streaming along the Internet. How the left stole reading. You're going to love this. Get the kids ready. They're going to like it too. Satanic worship, suing the right to sacrifice babies. And I'm not making this up. This here has just made a huge leap. And there's not a lot of people talking about what's going on here. In fact, I don't know almost anybody who's talking about it. And then finally, we're going to pull in Palm Sunday. Is it biblical? As I was preparing to do this little segment, I wonder how many people can actually explain Palm Sunday to your friends, those of you in the church. This is going to be an interesting segment for you. So let's, let's, uh, I'm looking forward to getting into that part of our program. First of all, possible good news. How about this? Conservative platform coming that so we've got our voices back. My Pillow CEO Mike Lindell to launch his own social media platform against censorship. We're going to look into this. I'm going to ask for everybody to pray about this. And I've been praying about it. If this actually comes off and it's primarily going to be the conservative right and the Christian right, we're going to look into seeing what we can do to be able to put advertisement or promotion or even possibly some kind of way to get a program, even if it's late at night, of uh, our church or God's unchanging word. Because the focus here of what we do, the target will be at this website. I don't even know if we have enough money, but that's a real possibility, and I've been praying about that. So I'm asking you to pray about it too. We need to find a way to reach the world, and this may be just one of those opportunities. So here's what he says. We're launching this big platform so all the voices of our country can come back and start telling it like it is again. And I'm all for that. And hopefully we can get a, be a part of that also. So anyway, pray about that. He says, you'll not need YouTube. You won't need these places, Lindell says. So it will be where everything can be told because we've got to get our voices back. People will be able to talk and not walk on eggshells. Wouldn't that be nice? Furthermore, the upcoming platform will allow for a single influencer person on the planet can come there. A single influence. How about a single influencer little church like we've got? Well, let's, let's pray about it these holy days. Let's, let's put our focus to that and see what we can come up with. And maybe this will be our opportunity. He says, you're going to have to have a platform to speak out. He says, it's not like we're a little Twitter platform. And what he does, he does big. He's got a lot of connections, so we'll be praying for that. All righty. Two weeks ago, we talked about the censoring with the Democrats, and we talked about how they're going to begin to promote and push spending money. Well, they pretty much got it out there. The Democrats rejected the, the efforts to send stimulus checks to prisoners. They rejected the effort to stop it. Ain't that amazing? So what are we looking at? Through Verify, prisoners will qualify. <laughs> I should have just threw this in and you can't make this up. But through Verify, prisoners qualify for stimulus checks, but getting them is another thing. So there's a real possibility that the Boston bomber can get a stimulus check. So then I thought about it and I started looking online at how many murderers are still in prison. And you ought to see all the mass murderers that are out there. They all qualify. They're making less than 80000 a year. And so they're going to get a check according to the bill. Whether they actually get it or not, I don't know. That's another one we need to pray about. All right, we also went into the systematic destruction of America, the border. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the border yet here, but I do need to mention a few things. And the reason is we're at the beginning of this border crisis. And it's going to go on for a while. We haven't even began to see the problems that are coming. But the, the Borden 
Biden's immigration policies caused a predictable border crisis. This is actually from CBS. Why didn't they plan for it, they said. I've got a video here to talk about the border. Let's take, take a look, and I'll be right back. Uh, I want you to walk us through what are the biggest and most important challenges our audience need to understand. Two things, Maria. One is uh, the dramatic increase in the influx uh, of people coming across the border. Uh, remember this, as you were kind of pointing out, uh, it's the Biden open border policies uh, that are inviting even more illegal immigration and actually have created this humanitarian crisis. Uh, as you know, I went down to the border this past week and I met with Border Patrol officers. Uh, and here's what they told me. The Border Patrol officers themselves told me that they informed the Biden administration that because of the policy changes, it was going to lead to this massive surge that we are just now beginning to see, knowing that it's going to be getting far worse in the coming months. Uh, they also said that the reason for the change, the reason for the increase and the influx is because of the policy change by the Biden administration. More importantly, though, Maria, is this challenge, and that is uh, the Border Patrol officers told me uh, that the Biden administration policies, they are enriching and they are empowering the drug cartels in Mexico who make money off of the people that they assist in uh, smuggling them into the state of Texas. The cartels make money off of these migrants uh, that you and your viewers see on TV. They also told me about the escalating numbers of the people coming across the border. Some quick numbers real quick. Uh, and that is uh, over all of last year in the Rio Grande Valley sector alone. So for your viewers in Texas, Texas has several border patrol sectors. In the Rio Grande Valley sector alone, all of last year, uh, they made 90,000 apprehensions. Already this year, in the first two and a half months of this year, they've made about 110,000 apprehensions, including in those apprehensions are 800 criminal aliens, criminal aliens who have previously been arrested and exported from the United States, 78 sex offenders, and 62 gang members, which include MS-13 gangs. And so, Maria, in response to this, uh, we had to launch uh, what I call the Operation Lone Star. Let me tell you what this, uh, what this operation does. Okay. What the cartels do, they surge all these people to the border and they fully occupy all the Border Patrol agents. And when those Border Patrol agents are occupied, they know that there are gaps along the border. And what the, uh, uh, what the cartels do, they surge people through those gaps. Operation Lone Star includes National Guard as well as Texas Department of Public Safety officers to fill those gaps to prevent uh, the, uh, the cartels from bringing across the border the most dangerous criminal elements as well as the opioids that they're trying to smuggle across the border. I'm going to show you just a couple of more slides here to talk about the perceptive from Mexico itself and the Mexican president, right? The DH admits that the border surge taps FEMA to, deter, to detain children. It's like they've got so much here, it's, it's become such an emergency, they don't have enough people to fix everything. So now they're bringing in FEMA, and they've got one camp that's supposed to hold 250 children, now have 1,800 kids in there. No cameras, no pictures, and there's no news crying out like they did with the previous administration. The Biden administration tapped the Federal Emergency Management management agency to help respond to a surge of unaccompanied children crossing U.S.-Mexican border with the agency working to expand the lodging for the migrants. It's right now, just about 10,000 kids came through in one month. Over 100,000 people have came through in February alone of the migrants. So they have no way to stop all this right now. And everybody's trying to get in now before something changes. So they're bringing in people, believe it or not, from around the world. This is a, a headline in Mexico from the Mexican president. Biden, the migrant president, is what they're calling him now. Even Mexico thinks that Biden is too lax on the asylum. The Mexican leader fears that the, migra the migrant president, <laughs> Biden, that's, can you believe that? He fears, and that's what he's calling him. He's, he's, he's labeled him now, will spark the boom for the cartels. It's now been revealed that there are so many human traffickers, they now use tagging systems to move illegals. Now, in case you don't know what you're looking at here, let me explain what that means, because I had to go back and say, what do they mean by tagging? Pull that back up, Jeff, the picture. See that picture in the bottom right, all the little tags? Just like as if you just went to the hospital. 
They got so many, so many people now that they got a list of them that they're going through. They're numbering and naming them so they can keep track of everybody. I mean, they got a system going on here. And I had wondered uh, in 2019 when the president of Mexico agreed with President Trump to help put all those uh, military and police on the other side of the border to stop this, why would he spend all that and be so happy to do it? This is why. I had no idea how much money the cartels are making on all of this. And they have created their own army and that the Mexican government basically can't stop them. And all this does is continue to embolden the, ego, the evil and the lawlessness that continues to, to uh, permeate uh, Central and South America. This is never going to stop until you fix the government and fix the systems of where the people live because they're struggling for a life. That's what they're looking for. And this is the beacon of hope. So it's just illegal coming in and it's creating the same problem over here because there's no way to do it properly. The Mexican president says Biden's asylum policies are enriching their cartels. Mexico's president is worried that the Biden asylum policies are encouraging illegal immigration and the business of human trafficking along the border with the United States. He said, we need to work together to regulate the flow because this business can't be tackled from one day to the next, according to the president. But there is no working with the United States. These things are done with the signing of a pen and anything that the previous administration did, it's just got to be reversed. Doesn't matter that it works as long as it's changed. <sighs> Excuse me. So that's what you're looking at. And they expect, and that's why I said we're going to be a lot more of this, I heard a figure for the first time yesterday that within the next four years, they expect five million illegals coming in. Five million illegals, unless they can get a grip on this. All right, let's move on. Canceling the culture of our youth. Remember this two weeks ago, we talked about poor Mr. and Mrs. Potato Head. They're gone. Can't, well, they're actually not really gone, but they had to relabel them. They're there, but they're going to be hidden. You know, they're Got to reverse now. You think about it. Remember the phrase, you can come out the closet? Well, now if you're straight and you're right, you're going in the closet. <laughs> it's reversed. <coughs> Can't make it up. How about this? Last week, this is when Dr. Zeus was having a problem. Two more characters. Remember we took them out? Pepe Le Pew, who's a racist. And, of course, um, Sylvester. Poor Sylvester. All right, how about this week? Governor Huckabee to our rescue, Dr. Zeus. New book he's got called, How the Left Stole Reading. Let's play that video, you're gonna love this. Well, Keith, you know I had planned to honor the birthday of the late, great Dr. Seuss by reading one of his books tonight. Yeah. But he got canceled oh. on his birthday. There's not a Seuss book to be found anywhere. So instead, I'd like to read another story. I think you're gonna like this one. Uh, Keith, this is pretty cool. It's How wait. the Left Stole Reading. That's the name of the story. Yeah. And uh, it looks so much like a Dr. Seuss book, but the picture on the front, it's scary. I don't know if you can see it, but it's a caricature of Adam Schiff. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> this, this story was actually written by Laura Ainsworth, who is one of our staff writers for the show. And she has done a beautiful job. So I'm going to read to you How the Left Stole Reading by Laura Ainsworth. You have our full attention. I bet you do. I bet I do. Can't wait. Every kid down in Kidville liked reading a lot, but the left who controlled education did not. They wouldn't say why, but we all know one reason. To read the wrong book means you're guilty of treason. They also just hated the folks on the right they said, we're oppressors, at least if we're white. But I think that the most likely reason of all may have been that their brains were two sizes too small. <laughs> Whatever the reason, their brains or their hate, they canceled the books that they deemed out of date. They stared at the kids from their ivory tower while focusing all of their brainwashing power. We can't let them read Dr. Seuss, they exclaim. We have to start erasing his name. 
we'll target six books with some troublesome art while keeping in mind that's only the start. Kids love Dr. Seuss, said the folks on the right. They knew they were facing a censorship fight. Why, he taught children how to be loving and kind and how they could grow up to be colorblind. Colorblind, screamed the left, their eyes practically bleeding. We must find a way to keep children from reading, to think the unwokeness their minds could retain. Why, they're reading the Bible, they're reading Mark Twain. And old Dr. Seuss, he's the worst of the lot. If kids want to read him, we'll say they must not. We'll say he's a bigot and lacks credibility. And then give all the children that book, White Fragility. We'll find all the books that aren't focused on race, we'll gather them up, and we'll hide them someplace. We'll substitute books that reflect our obsession with transgender studies and racial oppression. Well, the kids in Kidville would all cry boo-hoo when they found out what the leftists decided to do. The fun books were gone and they felt really sad. The white kids were taught they deserved to feel bad, but parents arose, they had had quite enough. They fought for their kids and it got pretty rough. They went to the school board and all had their say and their courage and their hearts grew three sizes that day. They brought back the books that the left had rejected and they made sure that freedom of speech was protected. The books were all safe and were put to good use and we ourselves honor the ones by Dr. Seuss. Dr. Seuss, canceling the culture. Here's some more being canceled. Look, look at this. The Aristocats, Peter Pan, Dumbo, Swiss Family Robinson. You can get them on, on the Disney Channel, but they're going to come with warnings. In their continued effort to promote diversity and inclusion, Disney has made select films unavailable on the children's Disney Plus profiles due to negative cultural depictions, particularly the racist stereotypes. The films are still available on standard Disney Plus profiles, but they come with an advisory content. Now, let's put this in some context here. There's a new law in New York on sex education. Puberty blocker lessons are given to eight-year-olds. It's actually as little, believe it or not, they began talking to them as early as pre-kindergarten about puberty blockers, whether they want to be a boy or a girl. The New York law mandates, it's a law, that sex education for kindergartens and a whole lot more. The New York Post report that the measure authored by freshman state senator Sandra uh, G. Brooke would bind the state's health curriculum to standards written by a left-wing interest group that advocates sex education for social change. Sex education for social change and would make the lessons mandatory statewide from kindergarten through grade 12. All right, so this is, this is really, really crazy. So the left is teaching young kids terms like LGBTQ, and this is according to the gay BCs. See the book up there? The gay BCs, not the A, but the gay. According to the, not, not the B, the book is aimed at preschoolers teaching them the alphabet through the lens of modern gender theology. This is, this is crazy stuff that's going on here. It is changing everything that God had in, intended for mankind to be. He created male and he created female. He didn't create all the rest of this. There's only two genders. It says, I mean what a three-year-old doesn't need to know terms like. How about this one? Bi, intersect, queer, and trans. So if you went through that book, what I just highlighted here and brought up, the T, this is the page for T. T is for trans. It's a brave step to take to live as gender to you know is innate. In other words, there is no more gender. So if you, if you choose to live as a trans, you're, you're a brave, encouraging, inspiring young person. Can you see what they're doing to the kids? Who was your hero when you grew up? Who do we look 
to for inspiration and for encouraging our families and our hopes for the future. But this is what they're building. I got another one too. G. G is, oops, let me back that up. G is for gay. It's a word that implies you're a girl who likes girls or a guy who likes guys. And the whole book is like this. It goes through the whole book, changing the way our society actually operates and performs. Romans 1.28, and I can use a whole lot more, but for time's sake, I'm not. I'm just going to give you this one scripture, and I got something I want you to, that uh, Audrey had sent to me, I think it's pretty humorous, but sad at the same time. It says, and even as they did not retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient or what are, is more like evil. So now let's put this in perspective, and here's what I'm talking about. So my child can have sex change, take puberty blockers, learn about sexual orientations at four years of age, but they can't watch Peter Pan, Dumbo, or Pepe Le Pew. Does that put it in perspective? It does, doesn't it? To give you a real, how, how out of touch the mind is of what's going on with the left and moving our culture into all of this. How did they do it? Canceling the culture. Already, let's go on. You can't make this up. Now, this is really serious. I call this serious. It may not seem like a whole lot right now, but you've got to understand the mindset of what's actually taking place here. The TST Temple sues. Now, who's the TST Temple? Texas. They sue Texas for religious interference. Now, I'm not making this up. That's why we put it under here. This is not humor in this section. This is for real. God's warning for disobedience. Let's put this in perspective before I tell you what's going on. Anyone who gave their seed to Molech, this is what God says, Leviticus 20, verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, And again you shall say to the children of Israel, that whosoever he be of the children of Israel, of the strangers that sojourn in Israel, that gives any of his seed to Molech, he shall surely be put to death, and the people of the land shall stone him with stones. That's how serious this was. What were they talking about? Giving the children of Molech to sacrificing their kids. That's what this was. It's amazing that God actually had to write it in his laws to say you can't kill your kids because the perversion of the mindset that takes place in human beings. God repeats those warnings over and over and over again. I listed just some of them right here. So when you get a moment, go back and read each and every one, see the warning that God had. But I want to read this one here, Jeremiah 19, verse 4 and 5. It says, but they have forsaken me, they have estranged this place. They have buried incense unto other gods to whom neither they nor their fathers have known, nor the kings of Judah, and they had filled this place with blood of innocence. They have also built the high places of Baal to burn their sons with fire for the burnt offerings to Baal, which I commanded not, nor spoke, neither did it ever enter in my mind, God said. So here we are in the time of Jeremiah. Now, when you look in the context of the Bible, that Jeremiah is a warning for us today in time. It's almost like God has given him as a prophet that we see what's going to take place in our time through his eyes. One of the warnings here is taking the children and giving them to Moloch or sacrificing them to other gods. Now, with that said, let me give you the story. The Satanic Temple sues Texas for regulations that interfere with their abortion destruction ritual. That's a headline. I didn't put that in there. That's actually a headline from the newspaper. The TST Temple, who is that? That's the one I was telling you about just a minute ago. Who are they? That's the Satanic Temple. On March 9th from Lightside News. <laughs> Excuse me. The Satanic Temple had sued the state of Texas, complaining that the abortion regulation, such as the sonogram, the viewing irregulation or the requirement, interferes with the temple's religious abortion ritual and therefore violates their religious liberty. Did you get that? Well, let me focus a little bit plainer. Interferes with the temple's religious abortion ritual, therefore violates their religious liberty. All right, so let's be clear, be really clear here. What we're looking at now is that they're suing the state of Texas for the right to sacrifice their children in a religious ceremony to their God, Satan. 
Does that make it plain enough? Nobody's carrying this story. If you get outside of a religious and those, those crazy, wacko, right-wing people, them conservative Christians, you won't hear this story. But this is a legitimate lawsuit in the state of Texas. And what are they looking for? We want our right to sacrifice our kids in a religious ritual. Jeremiah, God warned through Jeremiah that in his time, this was taking place. Remember the duality of events, a former, a latter, a physical, and a spiritual. You are in that stage right now. Now, I thought, I honestly, I guess, how naive can I be? How ignorant can I be in the, the ways of the evil? Thank goodness. Because the mind doesn't think that way. When you're in tune with God, your mind won't think this way either. In fact, even God says it never even entered my mind that people would want to do this. But here, what we're looking at here is that these people are, are wanting to kill their babies in a religious ritual. I thought in America, so well, just the abortion, that's very much like Baal. But no, it's, it's gone beyond that. Now it's actually gone into the religion to sacrifice babies. And they want a legal right to do this. I don't know. But I wanted to be as serious as I could with this, with this part of the program because, you see, God hates this. This nation is going to pay a price. Every Christian organization across the, this, this country and around the planet should be out screaming what's going on here. Because if you let this get passed, What's accepted and tolerated becomes the norm. That's what's going on right now. In August, we began covering the story, warning what's coming as early as August of 2018, when we showed the Satanic Monument in Arkansas. Look at that headline. The Satanic Monument was briefly but gloriously unveiled outside the Arkansas Capitol. That's an actual, that's an actual headline was but gloriously. This afternoon, the Satanic Temple had a rally outside the Arkansas State Capitol building alongside a giant statue of Baphomet, and they wanted to install it there permanently. So we got a couple of little pictures here that was going on. And look at that. If you, you keep the, pull that picture back up, Jeff. Little picture in the middle, read that headline. It says, Future Home of the Baphomet Monument. They were looking to be able to put it at the Capitol in Arkansas. By the way, in, in uh, Portland and in uh, Seattle, they have huge satanic worshipers and temples up there. In fact, I think Seattle has the head headquarters in Seattle. So you see where all this stuff goes on. You'll find that where there's roots that's going on right underneath it. Now, California, the education proposes, it just keeps getting better, a curriculum with chants to the Aztec gods. All right. They propose this curriculum under the title of Ethnic Studies, which calls for the decolonization of American society, which establishes the ethnic religious symbolism that's introduced to, by students to the Aztec God's prayers. So they're actually teaching them to get together and how to pray and to chant to the Aztec gods. It just, it just continues to deteriorate. You can see why God said, if he don't come back soon, nobody's going to have a shot. All right. What do I say? I mean, that, that segment there, just, that just takes a lot out of me because you, you, you can just see where things are going. This is absolutely unbelievable. You know, we need to cry loud and spare not. All right, so we're going to take a break, and we're going to come back. We're going to talk about Palm Sunday. Is it biblical? And if not, can you explain why it's not? So let's take a look at this little video here, Our King Forever, and I'll be right back.
welcome back. And he is our king forever. And thank heavens for Jesus Christ that came and did what he did. Because as you see from our previous segment there, there is it's like in the time before the flood, it's like the only in the mind of mankind is to do evil continually. That's what it looks like what's going on here. All right, I'm looking forward to this segment here because I've never done one focused just on Palm Sunday. All right, so now Palm Sunday. All right, let's talk about Palm Sunday today. Where does it come from? Is it biblical? So if you're watching this in a, on a tape or the DVD, just pause that for a second and see how much you know about Palm Sunday and what you can be able to share with your friends and loved ones. It's primarily Catholic, I know, so if you didn't live in a Catholic community growing up, you probably didn't focus on it at all. But here in New Orleans, especially where I grew up down in the Ninth Ward, in fact, where one of our other uh, co-workers here is in the Lower Ninth Ward, it's Catholics. I mean, there's Catholics everywhere. I mean, you, you can't go to a neighborhood, didn't have some giant Catholic church out there. So anyway, so what about Palm Sunday? Where did it come from? Believe it or not, the Catholic Church gets it out of the Bible, but it's not there. It's another one of Satan's counterfeit of God's plan. So now, if I put up there one of our, our little test questions, what does it counterfeit? What could you tell me? All right, so that would be a second question that I would give you. I want to answer that today. So Easter versus Passover, where does the worship day of Palm Sunday come from? Now, I know you can go into the book of John, and you will, you will show me where it comes from, but what is that hiding? All right, what is that hiding? And is it supported from Scripture? All right, so let's talk about that today. Choosing the lamb for Passover in Exodus chapter 12. This is where we start to explain what's going on. Exodus 12, verse 2. This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. And you shall speak to the congregation of Israel, saying that in the tenth day of this month they shall take every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And they shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. In the whole assembly in the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening." So now, what are we looking at? These are our two focal points to be able to explain the story. The 10th day of the month, and they keep it until the 14th day of the month. Why is the 10th day of the month important? That is when they choose the lamb that they're going to sacrifice. That lamb had to represent the coming Messiah, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And they would do that every single year. They would bring that lamb, they would separate it, they'd make sure that it was perfect. They couldn't find any blemish in it, and they have to go out and feed it. Just imagine the children. Probably got attached to that little lamb for those few days until the 14th day that they had to sacrifice that lamb. And every household had to have one, and they had to choose one every single year. Now, by the time of Jesus Christ, let's get to that the calendar, and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. So let's, let's pull in something here that maybe you haven't done before. I'm going to pull up a calendar, and I'm going to show you a couple of events. In this calendar, what you're looking at is on the left side is the Hebrew calendar, and on the right side is the Roman year. That's the Roman year by which you and I live today. So what you have here on the, on the, on the right side is the, the months that we have in the days, on the left side is the Hebrew calendar. We have a 365-day year. God has a 360-day year. So what happens is this always is fluctuating. God's calendar never fluctuates as far as our association with it. His first month's always his first month. Sometimes his year has 13 months. So according to the Hebrew, and I won't get into all that when the... When the <laughs> When the, the barley is in a beeve and then they, they count, and all they, it's not in a beeve yesterday, add a month in. It's a cycle that they go through. Thankfully, God gave the oracles to the Jews today, which we all understand. So now, I wanna, the reason I'm showing you this, though, is to give the idea of the year. See, here's the Hebrew year. I put a little box around it. Here's the Roman year. All right, so that's the Roman year that we're looking at. And there is the Passover week. Now, you notice what I put up here. 
This is 30 AD. The church has always taught that the Christ was sacrificed in 31 AD, which I'm still inclined to believe. Some people say 30 because that's when they have the record of a huge earthquake, which they believe occurred at the time of Christ's crucifixion. Remember, the earth shook and the temple shook, the curtain was torn. But now, here's what's interesting, though. In 31 AD, the middle of the week falls exactly the same way. So as far as the timing of it goes, what's important here is to understand is the day of the week when Christ was crucified. So here you have 30 AD and 31 AD, the Passover of uh, the 14th actually falls in the middle of the week. So now, here we have the 14th. So that's why that's important. Daniel 9, 27 says this, And he will confirm a covenant with many for one week, and in the middle of the week he will put an end to the sacrifice of the offering. So when Jesus Christ has confirmed the covenant for one week, this confirmation of this covenant began in Genesis all the way through till the end of Revelation, a 7,000-year period. In the midst of the covenant or the midst of the week, it says he would be cut off. And so he would be cut off in the middle of the week. What is the middle of the week? It's a Wednesday. So Passover has to be on a Wednesday. But the world today believes it's on a Friday, which is called the Crucifixion Friday, Resurrection Sunday. They get it, believe it or not, by determining Palm Sunday. I'm going to show you that. That's why this is important. So what is it, what is it hiding? The tenth. See, they're hiding the tenth when they choose the lamb. I'm going to show you how all this works in just a second. So here we are Wednesday on the 14th. Now, this is really an important study. And I didn't, and, you know, all these years I've never done one on Palm Sunday. I don't, just, just never did. We were talking about it. Preparing our program after we tape, we go, we get together, we sit down and say, what about next week? Well, the topic of Palm Sunday came up, and Clayton brought up a subject that I didn't even understand. Like, what do they do with the palms when Palm Sunday is over? Well, come to find out, it's a very important ritual. They're blessed. So now, now these palms are holy. You can't just throw them away. So they, they have to be buried, or they have to be stored or they give them back to the priest. And the priest will take and hold them all. When it's all over, he burns them. He saves the ashes for another year in the next year. All those ashes you see people walk around on their forehead or from the palms from the year before. I bet you didn't know that. I didn't know that. <laughs> I admit, I didn't know that. So when Clayton brought it up, I said, well, I got my attention. So now let's go on. Here we go. So now, let's, let's chart the week of Passover. This is why I didn't have as much news at the beginning. I want to take all the time I need here to tell you about Palm Sunday. So now we're still in Wednesday on the week. Wednesday. What was the only sign that Jesus Christ gave that he was the Messiah? They asked for a sign. He said, an evil, adulterous generation seeks after a sign. He said, I'm not going to give you any one but this one. Here it is, Matthew 12, verse 39 and 40. An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. And there shall no sign be given except for the sign of Jonas the prophet, or the prophet Jonas. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. All right, so that's the sign. If you throw the sign out three days and three nights out, well then the Bible is a liar, or you have to create something the Bible didn't give you, which makes the doctrine a lie. So right, let's go on. Let's put the weeks in. Now, I've got the weeks all the way to Sunday, which would actually be in Easter, and then I'll back it all the way up to Friday, the, the Friday before the Wednesday of the crucifixion. All right, so now I got, I've got Passover week laid out here. All right, so now remember... It has to be the 14th, and it has to be, according to Daniel, in the middle of the week for all this to work out. So now we come from 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th, and 18th on Sunday. So now we've got it laid out going forward. We're also going to lay it out going backwards in just a minute. <clears throat> the world teaches a Friday crucifixion, 
a Sunday resurrection. Now, somebody's got to get me the only son that he gave, that he was the Messiah, three days and three nights. I want you to sit down there, pull your calendar out. In fact, pull out a lot of calendars, because the calendar might be lying to you. Find me three days and three nights there. We should have that little, that little thing, ding, 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 ding. It's not there, is it? But people believe Jesus didn't mean this. He just meant three periods of time. Two days and one night, because that's what this is. Or, or two nights and one day, I'm sorry. Two, day, two nights and one day. You got Friday night, Saturday night, and actually only one day. Because he's put in the grave just before sunset, and he's up already by sunrise Sunday morning. So he's got one day and two nights. Not even close. I mean, somebody's got to wonder if Jesus Christ said that, and that's the only sign he gave, and you threw out his only sign, what do you got? Well... How in the world did it come up with this? Now, let's go on. It builds up right about here. John 12, verse 1. Then Jesus, six days before Passover, came to Bethany where Jesus, where Lazarus was, which had been dead. He raised him from the dead. So everybody came to want to see Lazarus. In fact, the priests were so mad that Lazarus was raised. They said, we've got to kill Jesus and we've got to kill Lazarus because of this miracle. Isn't it amazing you bring a man back to life who's been dead? We've got to kill him? That's crazy, but that's what, was, that's what actually was going on. Let's build the time back because it says six days before the Passover. This is amazing what they've done here. Now watch. All right, so there's Crucifixion Friday, which this is what they call Passover. That's the substitution for Passover. Passover, they think, is Easter, but actually one's the Crucifixion, one's the Resurrection. So here's the six days before, this is the Passover when he was put into the tomb. Now let's count back six days, right? Four, five, six. When does it come to? Sunday. Now, what do we have six days before Passover? It fits perfectly. What do we have here? Palm Sunday. Where did they get it from? They got it right out of the Bible. <laughs> Can you see how... Warp that is, but how brilliant. They're able to take something, and if you didn't know this, and you went to a priest and they said, Well, look, can you explain that? And they laid this out to you, it might leave you thinking, like, whoa, wait a minute. But they've hid something, something that's very, very important here. Because you see, Satan has a counterfeit for every single thing God does. And he creates the counterfeit to have you focus somewhere else. This is amazing what he's done here. All right, so where did they get it from? Right there in John 12, verse 13. Remember, we verse 1 was six days before the Passover, so now we're in verse 13. So they took the branches of palm trees, and they went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that comes in the name of the Lord. So what are they doing here? They're choosing their king six days before the Passover. What is the choosing of the king? They chose the lamb. You with me so far? In the 10th day of this month, they shall take every man a lamb. In their reading of this gospel account, in the perversion of not understanding what they're looking at, they have just fulfilled the requirement in the Old Testament of choosing the lamb on the 10th when it's actually the 11th. You following that? Isn't that amazing how slick this works? All right, so now let's go on. So now let's, let's go a little bit further. Let's put the Palm Sunday back up now. Now let's look at it from God's calendar where it's supposed to be. In the 10th day of this month, they shall take every man a lamb. All right, six days before the Passover, right? So now we're going to begin counting six days before the Passover. Let's begin to count. All right, now we're going back six days. Actually brings you to Friday. But now you're saying, well, wait a minute. That's not the 10th. Ah, let's look at this scripture. Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where they made him a supper. When is supper? Supper is in the evening time. At sunset, it becomes the 10th. 
right? But here's the key, verse 12. And on the next day, much people came to the feast. What's the next day? It's the daylight portion of the 10th. And what did they have there? It is the same verse we saw before of this scripture now moved over with the palms to Saturday, not Sunday. And they took the branches of the palm trees and they went forth to meet him and they cried, Hosanna, blessed, blessed is the king of Israel that comes in the name of the Lord. According to the Bible, according to scripture, six days before puts them to at supper time, Friday evening, which is the 10th. The very next day, he comes in on the donkey riding. They chose him to fulfill the scripture of Exodus 12 that he is the lamb chosen by the people. What's utterly amazing about all of this is as much as they chose him as a king, four days later they chose to crucify him in just four days. The timeline of crucifixion crucifixion for Jesus Christ, I'm going to leave that with you here. You can go in through the crucifixion of the timing of the day. And I got two of them here. You can go through the entire day where they're at. So what we have just showed you, let me back it up here into this scripture is really, really important that if you can explain this to a friend, you might just help open their eyes to understand that this, this period of two, two nights in a day, it's a lie. And if you can put some type of doubt about the foundation of what a person's been taught without condemning them and showing them in black and white. And that's why I use charts. That's why I use graphs. That's why I use pictures. Because if you can see it, you can understand it better. So that's what we're doing here. This is an amazing story that I, just one of those things I just never thought about until last week to bring out about Palm Sunday and the perversion of what it does to hide the choosing of the lamb. So really, when they choose on Sunday, they're choosing their God. And on Saturday, the Sabbath day, they chose Christ. So, we get back to where we were. All right, let's, let's begin to wrap it up now. All right, from the home office this week, in the mail, last week we had the sermons, Ears to Hear with Bobby Edmond and Pre-War Normalization Part 2 that went out into the mail. Now, this is the third week I'm, I'm announcing this, and I'm going to take it off for a while. But I want you to be aware that normally when you go to our website on God's Unchanging Word, this is, this is what you, you see here. That takes a little while to load up, and if you're at home, it's not a real problem because you've got a computer system, it's stronger. But if you're out on the road or you're using a handheld device, it's, it's real slow and very cumbersome. So what Bob Bourne has done for us, he's been able to take and change that. So if you went to NNI, which is News Nuggets and Insights, right? NNI.app. This is what shows up. Only News Nuggets and Insights shows up where you can get into it and you can, you can scroll up and down. You can get every single one of our, our past programs and you can access every single one of them. So now... So it, and it goes up real quick, it isn't very busy, and you'll be able to see everything you want to see. All right, Spring Holy Days, Passover, coming Friday night after sunset, March 27th. Unleavened Bread is on, on uh, uh, Sunday, uh, I'm sorry, I got the seven days here, March 28th through April 3rd. And so it's a special three-day weekend that's coming next week. Passover, Friday night after sunset. Regular Sabbath services on the 14th of the month, which is actually March 27th at 7 and 27 uh, Sunday, I'm sorry, Saturday evening at March 27th, night to be observed. So you have all three coming together three days. Sunday is the first day of unleavened bread. Sound like I kind of got that little garbled. I was, I was uh, thinking I was focused on something else, but let me explain that again. Friday night Passover. Regular Sabbath services on Saturday, and we're meeting here late, and we got our schedule here for four o'clock. So if you're going to tune in with us, we don't start till four o'clock then. That way, when people are, we're finished services, we can stay here and prepare for the night to be much observed, which is Saturday night. It's also the holy night for the first day of unleavened bread. 
Then we come back on Sunday at regular time, 1 o'clock, and we'll meet for the first holy day. So now, we're hoping you have a group that you can meet with for Passover, but if you don't, we get, we get several options for you to keep Passover. You can mail in the mail. We can mail you a DVD. Now, I want to take the mail off. It's too late to mail to us, but we can still get it to you if you get in touch this week because sometimes the mail gets really fouled up. But what we recommend is go to the website and request a DVD if you need one to be able to play or call us. 504-367-2005, 504-367-2005. So we can, we can get that out to you right away. Or just go to the website, you can view it on the website, and you can download it right from there. Or, God willing, we have the, the uh, internet fixed. We ran a test run today, and the internet still isn't working. We've called Cox Cable again, and they said they're going to have somebody out to find out why again. So this has become every week, it seems like, it's the same thing, a service they can't perform. So anyway, so uh, just in case, tune in, but if it's not working, have a backup. Have a backup for your Passover service. So it's also available online at the church's website. We will begin live streaming right here, 7.30 p.m. Central Time. 7.30 p.m. Central Time. All righty. You're getting down to the wire now to start cleaning out all that. What is that? Leaven. Get rid of all that leaven in your house. Kind of eat your way to perfection. <laughs> now, it's a good time to begin going through your food and your freezers. Use up all your leaven products. Begin cleaning out that house so you don't have to waste the food and throw it in the garbage can and get rid of it. So anyway, remember now, put a little sign up there, get rid of leaven. Get, get it out your house early. Well, that's it. That's it for our program today, except for one last video, which we always like to close with one upbeat, inspirational video. And here we have, He Has Overcome the World. Take a look. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Well, that's it for our program. I hope you, you were inspired as we were to be able to bring this to you. And please remember to pray with Mike for that Mike Lindell, that uh, web he's trying to put together, that maybe we can get something on there to continue to do an outreach for this work to warn the world for what's coming. Share this information as we ask each and every week. We appreciate you watching. We hope that you'll be a part of us every single week. Share it with everybody you know. We tell you that every week, but we really, really mean it. So please, share it. Let everybody know where you're coming from. Let them know what you believe, what you think. They're going to love you for it, or not. May this be your finest, your most inspired Passover and Days of Unleavened Bread that you've ever had. From all of us here at God's Unchanging Word, thanks for watching. Until next week, God be with you.